friends, welcome back to my book review channel. My name is Phoenix and I'm so glad you're here with me today. Today, I uh, it wasn't my favorite book. Uh, it, this is a nonfiction biography. It wasn't my favorite that I've ever read. Um, I didn't really enjoy the style of writing, but I did enjoy learning about the uh, subject who is Eleanor. Um, this is written by David Michaelis. And as I said, uh, the writing to me was not the most inspired. Um, I think also after having recently read The Splendid and the Vile, like, you know, it just, that was just so intimate. And this felt very kind of dry. But if you are an Eleanor Roosevelt fan, it does get you from A to B and give you all the breakdown of her life and it is very well documented. Um, he used a lot of information from personal diaries. She was quite pro prolific, quite a prolific writer. Um, I just felt like I didn't really get the flavor. I mean, and I don't know if it's maybe because she was quite a pers uh, private person, but then she had so much personal correspondence. I just didn't really ever feel like I got to know her. I don't know. Um, but I did enjoy learning about her. But I will say that this, this book actually took me about three weeks to finish, which is, I don't know if you recognize from how many book reviews I do, a long time for me. Um, but it just was not that enjoyable. Um, which is not something I really want to say because obviously like I don't want to turn people off of this book if like they like biographies and they like the subject matter. Um, maybe it just wasn't the right book for me. I just, I felt that it was a little uninspired, but maybe that's just me. Um, so if you don't know anything about Eleanor Roosevelt, she was born in October of 1884 and she did not die till November of 1962. So she lived an amazingly long time, especially for the time frame she was born. And she accomplished so much in her life and she truly was an amazing woman. Um, I think what was interesting was this novel kind of broke down her inherent desire to be of service to others. She was born into a bit of a, well, she was born into a troubled family. Her father was an alcoholic and she adored him. Um, and her mother didn't really seem to like her. She had, she just picked at her a lot. Um, consequently, I think her child, her relationship with her own children was a bit cold. Um, but she had a huge heart. I mean, she definitely worked for the benefit of the people. Um, she's pretty amazing. She, um, you know, traveled the world on America's behalf. She really loved America. And it, one of the really interesting things about her as well is that, you know, at a young age, she realized that she really, even though she went to a, a great school for the time for women or young girls and women, um, she realized that she didn't really know how to do anything. And she set out to start changing. I mean, she didn't really know how government ran. And then, you know, she got married, well, Probably before she got married to Franklin, um, she did start beginning to understand because she wanted to be able to contend, the, contend with these people, the politicians or people in Washington who she would meet at dinner parties or have to host in her own home. Um, she really did not want Franklin to be president, um, but she accepted that this was part and parcel. Um, and I also thought it was really interesting. I, I mean, she did so much for women. And I think, you know, sometimes people will criticize her unique situation with Franklin. He had a mistress and they, she knew about it. They lived openly, privately, if that makes sense. Like, of course, the rest of the nation didn't really know about that, but Eleanor did. And she they had a really great mutually beneficial relationship. And it's like, she did so much for the whole world, I think in a lot of ways in res in regard to how, how and what women could do. I mean, there were a lot of critics of her behavior when she was going around the world acting as an envoy on behalf of America. But with Franklin's, um, 
disability, you know, she was the perfect person to send and she had a huge interest in it. And she, she was a, a very good diplomat. Um, and she did that for basically her whole life. Even after Franklin died, she continued on and helped create the United Nations. She's just an amazing, amazing lady. So it was really interesting to read about her. I just wish the book had been a bit more inspired. Um, there were a few things I wanted to share with you that, you know, particularly were interesting to me. The first thing was that I really related to her on this. Her She did lose her mother. And this was a, was a description of how she felt about it when she lost her mother. And just really hit home with me. Eleanor did not react as an eight-year-old was supposed to when faced with the sudden irrevocable loss of her mother. She did take it as catastrophic. All my world seemed to have suddenly disintegrated all around me, but she also discovered, and yet life went on. Upon this first and most important lesson, the rest of her life would pivot. No matter what happened to one in this world, one had to adjust to it. And I deeply resonate with that because if you've watched my White Only Under video, you know that my mother passed on when I was a young girl. And it was just kind of shocking because my whole world was upended and yet it kept going. And it just seemed so sad to me that I would lose my mom and this amazing person was gone. And yet it didn't affect anybody else. It was just mind boggling to me. And personal tragedies are simply that way. <laughs> so... Um, that for me really hit home, really made me connect with her on that level. Um, and then I also wanted to discuss a little bit about um, Eleanor's unique contribution to American politics um, because she really set a trend. I mean, and I don't think it's been emulated ever. Um, for that was Eleanor's first great innovation, self-guided movement. Never before had a president's wife set out on her own to assess social and economic conditions in distant states or overseas to American possessions like Puerto Rico. Never before had a first lady visited a foreign country unaccompanied by the president, as Eleanor did the first summer, summer driving hick through eastern Quebec. Most Americans still expected the president's wife to stay home and take care of her husband and the house not to go up in airplanes or down a bobsled run at the Lake Placid Winter Olympics or inside a prison or Masonic temple. No one minded a cheerleader for the health of children's eyes and teeth. Gradually, few were minded that the wife of the president was driving alone by night through villages and four corners hamlets and stopping for gas on the outskirts of town. She made it plausible and safer for a woman to travel alone, to drive her own car. Um, here's just a funny, uh, not an interesting antidote. Did anyone ever tell you, said one filling station attendant peering in her window, that you look just like Mrs. Roosevelt? Oh, lots of times, she replied, smiling, and drove off. It became kind of like a national hobby for reporters to, like, count off the miles that she traveled because she was traveling all across the country. And she was doing really amazing work, reaching out to people, touching people, letting them know that they're cared. Um, I just... Who does that today? Nobody. And she was truly amazing. She had her own column um, that she wrote for years and years on end. And she basically never missed a, a, a every day she wrote an, a column. Um, and she never missed a column except for when Franklin died, I believe. Um, she missed four days. So she kept in touch with people. She let them feel like somebody else was showing them a different side of the conversation, um, a different perspective. She gave a lot of women an access into politics that they might not have had before. She spoke directly to them because she knew that they were going to speak to their husbands. Um, so I, I love that. Um, and then here uh, is something that I thought was really re relevant. Wait, is this it? Yeah. Um, What's this one? No, this one. This one I thought was really relevant because sometimes I get disheartened about, you know, some of the things that are going on in the world today. And uh, it's just basically when, during World War III, when there was a quota 
for how many immigrants could come to America. I mean, just like we have now. And there was a division of the world that, that was, or division, sorry, division of the country that really believed in keep America for Americans, which is a really complicated issue, right? Because we're all immigrants when it comes down to it. But, you know, we can't let everybody in because not everybody has our best intentions. But then again, like, how do you figure that out? Like, it's a very complicated thing and people want to act like it's so easy to say, no, shut borders and or yes, wide open borders. And it also made me think to, it also it gave me hope because one time I went to a therapist about relationship issues and the therapist said, you know, most couples have three main arguments that they keep arguing about, you know, throughout the length of their relationship and it's healthy and it's not a bad thing. Um, because you are rubbing up against each other's flaws or and you're challenging each other and you're making each other better you can make each other better if you do it in a polite and respectful way and it just made me think like america really is we have relationships with each other and we have different opinions and as long as we can maintain a respectful discourse we'll be able to get through it and we'll still be a great country i you know so i just felt um it, I just felt more like this is always going to be this. This is always going to happen. Like this, these conversations are going to have to keep happening because the world keeps changing and we're always going to have to decide who do we let in and who do we not let in and how do we make those decisions? Um, that is a fact of life. I mean, in your personal life, you have to decide who's a toxic person and who's not, who you're going to allow to have part of your time and who not. That's healthy. That's not unhealthy to say, I'm not going to allow every single person into my life and take whatever they want from me. That's a healthy boundary. So I just, it really gave me a lot of perspective on the situation that this is just something we as Americans and worldwide, we have to figure out and it takes, it's difficult. It's, it's always going to be a problem. And as you know just you have to put the work in and so um inspired me to feel less overwhelmed by the problem um then there was also something that she said sometimes you know in the last three years i've had some personal struggles and sometimes i think about the futility of life and you know, what does it really matter? You know, what I do, how, how, what is my influence on the world, you know? And, and she said something in here that I just thought was fascinating. And it really made me, again, gave me a new sense of perspective. She said, it is not one's activities, which are really important in this life. She decided when you lay down the things you do day by day, someone else always takes them up. The really important thing is what you are as a person what your character and your presence have meant to those you lived with and what influence you have had on the atmosphere of your home or your environment, regardless of whether this was a restricted one or a broad one, which touched many lives and large numbers of people. That is what lives afterwards in the memories and in the hearts of those who knew and loved you. As you influence these people, so, you, so your influence will spread through their contacts and their activities. You know, I, I feel like I live a small life and that's not a bad thing, but sometimes, you know, I'm human and I wonder like what my influence is and what good I'm doing in this world. And that just kind of brought it back home for me. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I just need to be the best person that I can and affect those that I love in the best way that I can. And those I don't love, you know, treat everybody with respect and dignity and, and be true to myself because that is who I am. I'm a person who treats everyone I meet with respect and dignity. So um, I just felt that was really, really beautiful, uh, effective way of saying that, El Eleanor's way, not mine, obviously. <laughs> and then also I found something I was absolutely delighted about. There is mention, um, Eleanor traveled all the way to the Pacific during the, um, the war. And there's mention of Eugene B. Sledge in here. And I don't know if you've watched The Pacific. I was completely unaware. I was more aware of the Western front of the war. I was more aware of what had happened in Europe than I was on the Pacific. 
And when I watched, there is a TV program called The Pacific. And when I watched it, I was just horrifying. Like I know war is terrible, but like sometimes I would have to turn it off because it was so moving and horrifying. And anyway, Eugene B. Sledge, who makes, who is mentioned in this novel, who met Eleanor Roosevelt, um, he's in the Pacific. He's in that TV show. Well, he's portrayed in the TV show. Um, so I was really excited about that. That's just kind of like an offshoot of something else entirely, but, um, I love that. And then, um, yeah, so I think that's all I have to say about this novel. It was, not the most enjoyable read. It did have a lot of great information. It is a biography. It's not going to be the most entertaining. So I think I was really just kind of hung up on the splendid and the vile and the way that that was written. It was so much, so much of the diary entries that I really felt like I got more of a, oh, also Winston Churchill was in this book. So that was interesting because he was, she was never mentioned in the Splendid and Violet, although Franklin was. So I thought that was interesting. And Harry Hopkins was a huge part of that novel and he wasn't a huge part of this one. So I was really interested. Um, I, I don't know if you can see or if it's backwards for you, but I do have this FDR book that I will be uh, reading. I have actually never read that book. So I'm going to be reading that, but probably not till August because I have a couple of others lined up to review. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for being here today. I hope you enjoyed my review of Eleanor. I would love to hear if you have a different opinion on the format of the book or this writing style. Um, yeah, it was just really not my cup of tea, but I am really glad I learned more about Eleanor Roosevelt because she is just such an amazing character and I found some really inspiring things about her and I am glad that I read it. I'm glad I stuck it out, but I was like, you know, I've never quit now and I'm certainly not going to quit when I have a book review channel. So I didn't. Thank you again for being here. Take care. I will see you next Sunday.